Good afternoon. Today is January 25th, 1999. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. And today we have the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Harry W. Watling, Jr. Good afternoon, Mr. Watling. Good afternoon. How, How are, are you? I'm fine. How are you? We are fine. Um, do you mind my asking you your age? Definitely not. I'm 60. And your current address? is Dennisport, Massachusetts. And I understand you just moved there permanently. Permanently from Natick, yes. And how long have you lived in Natick? I've lived in Natick five years on this term. Prior to that, I was lived here six years. And we'll explain that as the interview yes, goes on. We will. And you are married? Yes, I am. Your wife's name? Lori. And you have children? We have, I have three children and three grandchildren. Okay. And where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Wellesley, Natick, and South Burlington, Vermont. And what, what brought you, first of all, from Wellesley to Natick? My dad worked for the U.S. government, and as people in the business know, you travel a lot, and we had to move where my father's job brought him. And it went from Burlington to Boston, and we settled down in Wellesley. Mm -hmm. What was it like in Wellesley versus today? Oh, it was 180 degrees different. It was very different. In what way? Well, we moved from Vermont. We never had TVs in Vermont. And when we moved to Wellesley, that was our first introduction to TV. And it was a different breed of people. They were, I, you know, I've got to be polite. Uh, they were kind of standoffish and didn't accept us like we were uh, very, very different coming from Vermont. And how old were you when you came to Wellesley? I was 12. And in the schools, did you see that difference too? A uh, remarkable difference. But as time went on, they accepted us and things leveled right out and life went on. Mm -hmm. It was good. And where did you graduate from high school? I graduated from Wellesley High. And what year was that? 1956. How long did you live in Natick as a child? Uh, 19, right after I graduated, we uh, moved to Natick. So it was a, a one year time frame from Wellesley to Natick. Mm -hmm. And where in Natick did you settle? We lived right on Pilgrim Road, Natick, right off of Bowden Lane. Mm -hmm. So after high school, what were your plans? After high school was to take the summer off and go on the service. And what, so this would have been late 50s, 56, 57. 57. Mm -hmm. And did you make the decision on your own to join the military? There was four of us, very close friends. We went in the Navy on the buddy program, and I was living in Natick at time of entry. I started my military career in Natick. And were these friends from Wellesley or from Natick? They were from Wellesley. Mm -hmm. And you enlisted in the Navy. Did they all enlist in the Navy also? We all went in on the buddy program, correct. And where did you go from here? We went from here to the Fargo building in Boston and took a train to Bainbridge, Maryland, to the U.S. Naval Training Center, Bainbridge, Maryland. And that was a three-month boot camp. What was that like for you? That was very different. It was very hard. It was difficult. It was long. Uh, there was a lot of unpleasant times, but it was a growing time. It was a good time. We realized after a while that they were helping us mature. What was a typical day like in Bainbridge? It was extremely long, five in the morning till 10 at night. And there was very little rest in between. It was interesting. When you went in on the buddy program, was there guarantees made to you at that time? There were no guarantees other than the fact that if you uh, kept your eyes and ears open and your mouth shut, you'd make it. Uh -huh. And don't have an attitude. They were very, very strong about that. Only speak when spoken to. They were characters. And during this boot camp experience, um, did anything come out as what we might call a specialty that you surpassed the others in? They or? tested everybody in boot camp. They gave them hearing tests, eye tests, uh, sonar tests to see what they thought you could excel at. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me into the, well, the, after the release in boot camp, that's when they sent me to main propulsion in the Navy. Main propulsion? Main propulsion. That was the engine room. 
Mm -hmm. And so after boot camp, where did you I go? I went from boot camp right from uh, Bainbridge, Maryland to Mayport, Florida. Florida. Was that your first time down in, in Florida? That was my first experience to Florida. And what, do you remember what that was like for you? It was outstanding. I loved it. In what way? I got off the train in Jacksonville, Florida, went to the Mayport to the Carrier Basin, went aboard the Carrier, and one day later we left for the Mediterranean Sea for a nine-month cruise. So I didn't see too much of Florida. Was the cruise something that you had to get used to, being uh, out at sea? Being out at sea, yes it did. This is embarrassing, but I'll tell you anyways. I was uh, seasick for the first two weeks on the, one of the biggest ships in the Navy. But after I got my sea legs, everything just panned right out and it was fine. When you're seasick like that, do you, are you able to get help from the doctor on board? or? Well, they bring you down to sick bay and they give you what they call an APC, an all-purpose capsule. It's an aspirin. Then you go back to work. <laughs> There's no mercy. You're not supposed to be sick at sea. And I'm sorry, I don't know if you mentioned the name of the ship? It was the uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt and it was a CVA-42. And can you explain that, what that is? A C stands for carrier, A stands for aircraft, and uh, V means, no, C is carrier, A is attack, V is aircraft, CVA. And approximately how many people are on a ship like this? There was about, oh, I have to think now, I'd say about 4,500. It was a large ship. It was the fifth largest carrier at its time in 1957. And at this time in the Mediterranean, was everything at peace or was there some? No, not necessarily because we were involved in the Lebanon crisis in 1958 and that's a little known conflict. And we landed Marines in Lebanon in September of 58. And at that time it did not escalate but it was very, very close to it. It was a big operation that very few people today remember. When it was going on, did you realize at that time that this was something big? No, we had no idea because communication, when you're that young and that new to the Navy, you're taught very little. Mm -hmm. You're told very little also. Mm -hmm. So we found out very, very little as far as communication. So while in the Mediterranean, you had a schedule of work, I would assume? Oh, a schedule, yes, we all had schedules. And what would be a typical week, for instance? A typical week? A uh, typical week would be uh, seven days a week. And it would start at five in the morning. And you ate, and you went to your duty station, and you worked in your area all day long. And then after your duty day, if the shift time was correct, you pulled your uh, four-hour duty day, your watch. So it, was, it could be a very long day. And your duty station, you mentioned, would be uh, the, engine, the room. engine room. Number three engine room. And at that point in time, was it difficult work? Uh, in the beginning, it was very, very hot, and your body had to get accustomed to the 110 degree temperature. It was very hot. But like everything else, like seasickness, you get your sea legs, and when you get in the engine room, you get accustomed to the heat. Your body, well, I could say, if that's the right proper word, acclimates itself to it. And while in the engine room on duty, approximately how many other people would be with you? I would say approximately 20. Were there down times that you could chat at that time? Very few. Mm -hmm. You were not there to talk. You were there to work. Mm -hmm. And they made it very clear. And then your off time, what kind of off time would you have and what would you do? Uh, depending upon your, uh, your watches, uh, your off time, you could go to the movies. You could, go, uh, you could go to the ship's library and read. You could go out in the uh, flight deck and just uh, watch the flight deck operations, which were fascinating. I spent a lot of time doing what I wasn't supposed to do up in the 07 level. That's seven levels above the flight deck, watching the flight operations. It was fascinating. Night flight operations. It was beautiful. So they, these would be jets coming off these your... Would, these would be jets taking off and landing. On your ship? On our ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Because you were, it was probably considered a city within itself. It was. Were there times that you could mingle with the people that were involved 
on the upper deck versus those in the Yes, there were. There, mm -hmm. If you got to be friends with them, there were times when you could, you know, you struck up a friendship with them, but you really didn't have too much time. Mm -hmm. And then what about uh, shore time? Were you ever able to... Liberty? Mm -hmm. Although we, we, we pulled in, I should say we anchored offshore in all the largest ports bordering the Mediterranean Sea. We had, uh, I would say, a month out at sea and then maybe three days in port. So we hit the Rock of Gibraltar, Barcelona, Cannes, France, Naples, Italy, etc. What was your favorite place? Uh, I liked Naples, Italy, and I also, on an even scale, I liked Greece. Athens, Greece. Beautiful, beautiful ports. Were, did you find that the people in these ports were friendly towards all on of the, you? On the most part, they were very friendly. Mm -hmm. They were very good. Any close calls or MP issues at that time uh, that you care to talk about? Maybe we should just the uh, statute of limitations hasn't run out yet. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. Uh, because it was such a large ship, as you said, 4,500 people, did you find that um, there were a lot of, even within the U.S., cultural differences on the ship that you had to get used to? Uh, no, there weren't. Mm -hmm. In those years, we did not have the problems. We were very fortunate. Mm -hmm. Everybody worked together as a team. That's what it was, teamwork. And how long were you on the Franklin Roosevelt? I was on the Roosevelt uh, two and a half years. And then I was transferred to another carrier out of uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And wh what was that one? That was a USS Boxer LPH-4. And explain that. That's a landing platform helicopter. We brought Marines from Norfolk to the island of Viegas, down off of Puerto Rico for their training maneuvers. It was a helicopter assault ship. And so this would have been in the early 60s. This is correct. What were they training for? They were training for any situation that may arise in the future. Did you find it a big difference between that situation versus the one on the Franklin D. Roosevelt? It was 180 degrees. In what way? Well, in the Franklin D. Roosevelt, I was in the engine room. And my rating allowed me, when I transferred, to keep the same rating and go to air conditioning and refrigeration. So when I went on the boxer, I was allowed to go in the AC and R division, and they let me go in the after steering room, which was air conditioned. Thank God, because when we made their trips down to Vegas, it was much hotter than 110 degrees, very warm. But I enjoyed it. I had good duty, and I was. I had no complaints. I was very fortunate because there was only one man assigned to the after steering compartment and by law it had to be air conditioned because of the uh, delicate operation down there. That was the after steering compartment of the uh, carrier and if the bridge got knocked out they'd have to steer it down below. That was my duty station and it was air conditioned. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And how long were you on that ship? I was on that ship for about oh, a little over a year. So it took you back and forth to Puerto Rico from Norfolk? Back and forth, mm -hmm. back and forth. Many, many trips. Were you able to do any site visiting on the, on port, in Puerto uh, Rico? Very little. Because of the nature of this, this carrier being a helicopter carrier, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have very, very few times for Liberty. It was strictly business. And did you like the Norfolk, Virginia area? Uh, I got to like it, but Norfolk uh, at those times was a tough town. They always said sailors and dogs keep off the streets and off the grass. I'll never forget that. Were you able to make some friends, other than the buddies that you had gone in with, yeah. had they all been assigned to different places at that point also, or were any of them with you? No, after boot camp? Mm -hmm. No, after boot camp, you uh, it's just everybody goes all different directions. They split us up. And were you able to make any long-term friendships in your tour duty? I made a long-term friendship for a friend, his name was Clark Warren, he was from Topeka, Kansas. And we were together on the Roosevelt for well two and a half years. How do you spell his last name? W-A-R-R-E-N. First name was Clark. 
And do you stay in contact with him today? I stayed in contact with him for four years, but all of a sudden, it something happened, and I it it's you know it's frustrating, and it just stopped. Mm -hmm. The postcard stopped, and the letters stopped. So you have no idea. What I have no a, idea mm -hmm. where Clark is, but a very good friend of mine, Skip Workman from uh, New Harbor, Maine. I still am in contact. He's one of the friends that I went in from Wellesley with. He came up from my retirement party at the Ashland VFW, all the way from New Harbor, Maine, and we are very close. So after Norfolk, then what? After Norfolk, I got discharged from uh, the boxer. I got after my four years active duty, and I came back to Natick as a civilian. So what? That would have been again mid '60s. That was early, early '60s. Early '60s. Early '60s. I got my final discharge in 1963 because in those years you signed up for four for six years, four active and two inactive. So I got my final discharge in 63 and I was still a resident of Natick. What was Natick like in the 60s? It was great. It, was a one, it still is a wonderful town. I like the town. Mm -hmm. I really would have loved to have settled down here, but the real estate was out of my reach. Mm -hmm. But Natick is, a, I, I have a lot of faith, a lot of respect, and I just like the town. The people are super mm -hmm. in all areas. So you're out of the service after a total of how many years? Six years in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Then what? Then I went to work for four dealerships in Framingham. I was in supply in the parts department. I had 21 years, and then I made a decision to go into the Massachusetts National Guard, and that got me a full-time federal civil service job working here right in Natick on Speen Street. So you went from Navy to, to dealership supplies. Dealership supply. Mm -hmm. And my resume with Framingham Ford got me a job with the federal government in supply and logistics. And you happened to station yourself right down on Spean Street. Right in Natick. So tell us about that. What was a daily daily job? Daily at the job National Guard? was uh, mainly warehousing. Uh, Usually from, so we had a 40 hour compressed work work. We worked 10 hour days. So it's usually seven in the morning till five at night and all aspects of warehousing. We supplied every unit of the Massachusetts National Guard with everything they needed to function with. So you started there. In 82. 80. So this would have been also during a time, we, uh, notate right now your shirt that you have on, which is a Desert, Desert Storm, Storm <coughs> shirt. Yes. So were you directly involved in supplying for that Absolutely. particular conflict? We were activated in the warehouse to supply our units in Massachusetts that went to Desert Storm. And we gave them everything that they could. Tell us a little bit about some of the unique things that maybe the everyday listener may not know that, that you would have to supply a, a ser service-connected supplies. You mean to a unit being activated? Mm -hmm. Well, a unit being activated would at that time went to Fort Devens. Fort Devens, once a National Guard unit gets activated, you lose the, the umbrella of your home state and you're under the U.S. Army. Well, these units that went to Fort Devens as a jumping off place for the desert, they uh, didn't get everything they were supposed to get. And they were promised <coughs> that the Army would take care of them, which unfortunately it didn't. But to make a long story short, when we found out that our units from this state were up in Fort Devens and they couldn't get what they want, we just did what we had to do and we took care of our people. And, and some of the things that, would it be because of a shortage of supplies? A shortage of supplies on the federal end as far as the umbrella from Fort Devens, the regular army. Mm -hmm. And was, they, they had a tough job. I, they had people from all over New England mobilizing in Fort Devens. And they didn't have the resources or the equipment or the supplies to take care of all the New England states. So th the bottom line is you help your own, you take care of your own people and any others you can. So we gave them all the help we could out of our supply system here in Natick. What would some supplies be like that might be different for a desert situation versus, say, parts of Europe or...? Uniforms. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with the uh, 
We had to help them with their uniforms. We had to help them with small things, but they're important things like batteries for the night vision devices, mm -hmm. which they couldn't get through the normal supply channels in Devon's. Um, blankets, they had a shortage of blankets, and those are very common things, which you would think. And as you know, at nighttime, the desert gets very, very cold, so we had to give them the uh, space-saving blankets, the ones you roll up. They're very, very small, but they have aluminum foil on one side and orange fluorescent on the other. We also have the, uh, the U.S. Army Natick Labs. Natick Labs here. <clears throat> yes. Do you collaborate with them in a situation like this at all? Uh, no, that would have been like apples and oranges. The Natick Labs did, has been doing and will continue to do a fine job. Mm -hmm. But what they did for the troops going over was, was their responsibility. We didn't get involved in what they were doing for our troops. Mm -hmm. There was no problem as far as working together on that end. Now, had you heard prior to Desert Storm up and running anything about any kind of issues with regards to chemicals or specialized warfare and therefore have I, to support them in any way? I heard after the fact. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, two of my very good close friends with the 1058 Transportation were involved in that when they, uh, I'm trying to remember how it happened, but the government said that there was no chemical buildup or any chemical problems. <clears throat> well, they were there at that ammo dump and the chemical dump when it was blown up and they took pictures. And they went back to the VA and said, we're putting a claim in for exposure to chemicals. And the government denied it and they brought out the pictures and said, we were at the ammo dump and chemical dump when it blew up. How about our claim? So I guess you know what happened there. And did they have any after effects also? Uh, they have after effects now, yes mm -hmm. they do. So typically when things are going okay, national security, et cetera, what was it like at the National Guard in Natick? I mean, so often we drive by that area. And never, never know what's going on never know what's there. going on, right. We were, uh, we were very busy. We, we supplied them with all the chemical over garment protective units they had, you know, the suits. And uh, we worked as long as we could to make sure they got what they needed. We wanted to have them completely supplied. Even after they were over there, we shipped stuff over. Mm -hmm. And they were very, we flew stuff out of uh, Hanscom and we flew supplies out of Westover for them. Approximately how many people were working in your supply depot area? In the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, there was about 250. I'm talking the whole complex. Mm -hmm. And at the end? At the end, uh, the supply depot has moved to this new state headquarters in Milford, Mass. But the warehouse is not. There's uh, seven people left there. And just as a point of information for those who may be viewing this tape, the National Guard area is where our police station was housed temporarily while they were building the correct. new site. They were our neighbors for two years. For two years. Yeah. And I know that was very well thought of by everyone that that could be arranged. We had a good working relationship. It was nice to have them beside us. So you were with the National Guard from 1982? Uh, 1982 to 1999, January 2nd. Just, that, just this month. It's a mandatory retirement. Once you're 60 in the Guard, you're out. But the tie-in with the United States Code, if you're working full-time for the federal government for the Guard, you have to leave your job, too. It's a law. It's not a problem. You just have to say thank you. Mm -hmm. It's been nice. So you spent quite a bit of your time in some branch of service. Yes. Connected. Um, All that equates to a 20-year pension. The 16 years for the uh, National Guard and the four years active duty Navy gave me a 20-year pension. So now you're a retired gentleman living in Dennisport. Dennisport, Mass. And getting acclimated to the fact that you don't have to get up and go to work every day. It's a different way of life. It's great. Yeah. But I don't want to get used to it. I do not want to pull up a rocking chair. Do you have any ideas as to what you might be doing in the future, even if it's on a volunteer basis? At this point, no. I really, I've, I've got uh, four or five resumes out in various agencies, and I'm just going to uh, take one day at a time. 
Looking back on your Navy experiences and your National Guard experiences, do you have any thoughts on some memorable experiences or characters or humorous things that kind of leave you chuckling? I had one. When I was on the, uh, the hangar bay of an aircraft carrier, I was always a nonconformist, but uh, I always wore my hat in the back of my head. And I had one young lieutenant come up to me after three months at sea, and he, uh, he said, I've been watching you, son, for months. He says, you're going to get written up. And I said, gee, what's that? He says, you're going to find out. So he took me up and he wrote me up a big piece of paper and brought me for a captain's pass. I don't know if you're aware of it, but a captain's pass in the Navy is very serious. It's not a joke. And uh, make a long story short, two days later I went up in front of the captain with the lieutenant that wrote me up. And the captain said, do you know why you're here, son? And I said, yes, sir. I says, I was wearing my hat wrong. And at that, he looked over at the lieutenant and said, you're bringing me, a man that's been on this ship, 17 years old, for wearing his hat wrong to a captain's mast. He says, you didn't realize the significance of a captain's mast? You could be drummed out of the Navy. And I says, that's not very nice. He said, well, we're not going to do that. But he said, let me tell you one thing, son. He said, from now on on, he says, I'm sure you're going to wear your hat squared away. You just dro I'm sorry, you dropped your mic. Yeah. Let me just fix that. Did you shut it off? No, you can just clip it right back on. Where was it? Right here is fine. Right here? Yeah, just pinch it. Perfect. Great. Okay. Sorry. Then he turned to the lieutenant and proceeded to give him a royal chewing out. He said, don't you ever, ever bring a man before me on such a ridiculous infraction of rules to a captain's mask. And as I left, he was still chewing the lieutenant out. But I always wore my hat properly after that. I learned my lesson. And now you see young kids all the time wearing their hats they backwards they like do. this. They do. Isn't that amazing? Yes, yes. Um, how important do you feel it was serving the military? And, and a, a second part of that question, how do you feel that it helped you or hindered you for the rest of your life? I was giving a very good sense of direction, <clears throat> a lot of discipline, and it, 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 it filled in all those, those years, those, I don't know if it's a proper way of saying it, but where you don't know where you're going at a young age. And it, uh, it, it, it gives me a very good background, been mostly discipline. One of the questions that we do ask a number of our veterans, um, whether they were in combat or not, but certainly you were of the generation that saw a lot happening either before or after you were in the military and also certainly with the National Guard. How do you feel about the difference of public opinion regarding veterans from World War II, the Korean conflict, and um, Vietnam? That's kind of a difficult question to answer. <clears throat> It's, uh, I guess it'll be brought up at the tail end of the report, but uh, it's like they have short memories. And uh, a lot of them didn't care, but I noticed that once you come to these wonderful observances they have here in Natick, uh, Natick does very well for its veterans and they do remember. Other towns, you, and I've seen the years go by, the public coming out and the local politicians, they've kind of faded away, which is kind of sad. But uh, it, it's a tough question to answer. Mm. Is there anything, a thought, a, a comment, or memory that you would like to share either with your family, with the community, or also with those who may be watching this tape in the future? Uh, I do have my last, my last comment, and it's, uh, it's just that it's on the memorial over here on the bridge the Vietnam Memorial, it's mm -hmm. freedom is not free. And uh, I just have to say, if you love it, enjoy your freedom, thank a veteran. And many of our highly elected state and federal officials have very short memories. Well, we would like to thank you. That's a very touching way to end this uh, conversation. We appreciate your coming in and coming up from the Cape in order it's to, not a problem. to uh, interview with us today. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you for your time. You're welcome.